Okay, we're rolling. In the 13 years since your book, Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, was published, has more evidence come out that either supports or refutes the main claims made in the book? Well, I think it's been so exciting to see how the book is done and uh, how it really still basically fits in with what we understand about uh, cardiovascular disease and how to control it. Really, the, the chemistry behind heart disease, because we're all experts would agree that where this disease appears to have its inception, its onset, its beginning, is when we progressively injure the life jacket and the guardian uh, of our blood vessels, which happens to be that delicate innermost lining called the endothelial cell. And the endothelium manufactures a truly, a truly magic molecule of gas, uh, nitric oxide. And nitric oxide is responsible for the salvation and the protection of all of our blood vessels because of its numerous positive, powerful functions. For example, uh, nitric oxide keeps all the cellular elements within our bloodstream flowing smoothly like Teflon rather than Velcro. It keeps things from getting sticky. Number two, nitric oxide is the strongest blood vessel dilator in the body. When you climb stairs, the arteries to your heart, to your legs, they widen, they dilate, that's nitric oxide. Number three, nitric oxide will protect the wall of the artery from becoming thick and stiff or inflamed, protect us from getting high blood pressure, hypertension. Number four. Now, number four is the absolute key. A safe and normal amount of nitric oxide will protect us all from ever developing blockages or plaque. So literally, everybody on the planet, whether they are from London, Berlin, Chicago, New York, or Cleveland, or Dallas. If they now have heart disease, it is because in the previous decades, they have now so sufficiently trashed, injured, compromised, and turned their endothelial system into a train wreck, they no longer have enough nitric oxide to protect themselves from developing blockages and plaque. But the good news, this is not a malignancy. This is a completely benign foodborne illness. And once you can get patients to stop ever again passing through their lips additional foods that are going to injure further an already train wrecked endothelium, then the endothelium begins to recover, makes enough nitric oxide so that not only can we halt disease progression, but we may often see ev evidence of disease reversal. Now, the obvious question, therefore, is what are the foods that every time they pass our lips, we injure the endothelial cells? They are, one, any drop of oil, olive oil, corn oil, soybean oil, safflower oil, sunflower oil, coconut oil, palm oil, oil in a cracker, oil in a piece of bread, oil in a salad dressing. To reinforce this whole idea and concept, I wrote an editorial in the International Journal of Disease Pre uh, Prevention and, and uh, Reversal uh, from 2019. And the title of this was, Is Oil Healthy? And I go through the animal studies as well as the human studies showing how oil injures the endo endothelium. So that means, what are you gonna eat? You're gonna eat all these marvelous whole grains for your cereal, bread, pasta, rolls, and bagels. 101 different types of legumes, beans, lentils. All these marvelous red, yellow, and green leafy vegetables, and sweet potatoes, white potatoes, and some fruit. And there are many recipes out there available 
in my book, the one by my wife and my daughter, John McDougall, Neil Barnard. They're just a, a bunch of wonderful recipes. Food that looks good, smells good, tastes good, and is going to actually enhance your health, not destroy it. Yeah. Now, there is another wrinkle in all this <clears throat> that's pretty important. We've talked about the importance of nitric oxide. And the way nitric oxide is made early in our years, and the way that we sort of are born with a powerful nitric oxide producing factory, type one of nitric oxide production, which is our endothelium, the lining of all of our blood vessels. And you, at age eight, let's say I was standing up, here would be the level at eight years of age of your nitric oxide, right? Right at the top, no problem. Now, you ever hear of an eight-year-old who got a heart attack? Doesn't happen. So, but here you are. Now you're 24 years, oh, you've lost some of your endothelial production of nitric oxide. You're 24 years old. You get hit by a bus. You die. At autopsy, they see what? The foundation for coronary artery or heart disease. Not enough for a cardiac event yet, but there you are at 24, already with a disease getting established. You continue to eat that way, and now you're in your 40s and 50s. Now we start to see these clinical cardiac events, heart attack and stroke, because the disease has now progressed to that extent. A disease which we have been developing since childhood. So we want to be as kind as we can to this endothelium. So one of the things that I do for new patients with cardiovascular disease, I ask them to imagine shrinking their head to a size that it could fit inside the arteries to your heart and find and look at the blockage. It would be an absolute cauldron of oxidative inflammation, so we need antioxidants, but no, do not <laughs> go down to the health food store and buy a jug of pills that says antioxidant because it doesn't work and it's gonna be harmful. We need you to get your antioxidants from food. Fair enough, what food? Food that is high in what we call ORAC value. O-R-A-C, oxygen radical absorptive capacity. So <clears throat> if you're having raspberries, blueberries, strawberries, and blackberries with your morning oat cereal, that's a terrific start. However, nothing, nothing, nothing can trump the antioxidant value of green leafy vegetables. So I need you to chew six times a day a green leafy vegetable about three quarters the size of your fist that you run a first boil in water, five and a half to six minutes so it's nice and tender. Then you must anoint it with several drops of a delightful balsamic vinegar or rice vinegar because the acetic acid, the acetic acid in those vinegars has been shown to restore the nitric oxide synthase enzyme contained within the endothelial cell that is responsible for making nitric oxide. Now, therefore, you're going to chew this alongside your breakfast cereal, again as a mid-morning snack, again with your lunch and sandwich at 3, mid-afternoon, 4, dinner time, 5, and I adore it when you have that evening snack of kale. What are you doing? All day long, you were bathing and basking that horrible cauldron, cauldron of inflammation, the plaque, with nature's most powerful antioxidant. Now... <clears throat> That's number one. That's the original nitric uh, pathway from our endothelial tissue, which now we really ought to address the second pathway because uh, as I said, the first pathway, by the time you're 50, there's only 50% of that left compared to what, when you were age, what was there when you were age uh, 25. When you're over 75 to 80, 
you've lost close to 70% of that number one pathway. And nitric oxide is such a valuable molecule. It's been exciting to, to understand how we can uh, use a second pathway that the body makes available to us that is just really sort of emerging in uh, clinical awareness. And that is, you do the same thing. You chew the green leafy vegetable. But when you're chewing the green, you are chewing a nitrate. As you chew that nitrate, it itself is now being reduced by these facultative anaerobic bacteria that reside in the crypts and grooves of your tongue. That green nitrate you're chewing is now being reduced to a nitrite. Now, when you swallow the nitrite, your own gastric acid reduces the nitrite to more nitric oxide. So which is a very uh, powerful and exciting pathway. And obviously, while you can improve it with one dose of arugula, or one dose of beet greens, or one, one dose of kale, if you have it, again, as it, six times a day, yeah, you're really you're, uh, actually uh, optimizing the capacity of this second pathway. So this is uh, something I think is so important and essential in treating these patients to have them recognize what, uh, what the importance of this is. Now, you might say, well, what, a, what are the greens that I'm talking about? They are bok choy, Swiss chard, kale, collards, collard greens, beet greens, mustard greens, turnip greens, napa cabbage, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, cilantro, parsley, spinach, and arugula, and asparagus. And the top five are kale, Swiss chard, spinach, arugula, beet greens, and beets. Uh, pretty exciting stuff. Is it really possible to be heart attack proof? Is it possible to be heart attack proof? I don't think there's any question that when you are eating this way, you are really restoring and maintaining what I would call an endothelial fortress. So if you have an endothelial fortress, even if you've got cholesterol that's higher than many of the societies in medicine suggest, or maybe you've got an APOA type of cholesterol. If your, cholesterol, if your endothelium is an absolute fortress, you've made yourself heart attack proof. Especially you know, by not eating foods that are going to injure it. And that, and that can be done. And that's what we, why we see so many cultures on the planet where heart disease is almost virtually non-existent. What makes you think a whole food, plant-based diet is the optimum diet? Many doctors recommend paleo, low carb, Atkins, or keto diets. Why is there so much debate? Do you know something they don't? What we have to do is when you see uh, all the different magazines, books, television shows about all these different diets. I, I always like to refer to what my good friend John McDougall said about that plethora of other things out there that are bestsellers. And he said this, people love to read good things about their bad habits. And what I always suggest to patients if they have a confusion is look at the author and see what research they have done and whether they have been able to publish their research in a peer-reviewed scientific journal. Because that really is almost a basic minimum to get uh, clarity on the authenticity of the research. But if you were to ask me, are there, uh, what are the studies that have taken patients who are seriously ill with heart disease put them on a diet and have their disease not only be halted, but see evidence of disease reversal. I don't see that we've ever seen that with a DASH diet. We've never seen it with a Mediterranean diet. 
We've never seen it with a paleo, paleo diet, keto diet, Atkins diet, Barry Sears diet. And these are all kind of reputable people, but uh, if, you're, if you were somebody out there trying to find a diet which seems to have the best track record, as a matter of fact, if, as far as I know, it's whole food plant-based nutrition is the only nutrition, both as an Ornish's study and our study, that will take and reverse heart disease. In October of 2015, the World Health Organization said red meat has the same level of carcinogenicity as smoking cigarettes. Please explain this. Well, this has taken a number of studies, but <clears throat> it's increasingly apparent that when you look at the larger studies that are available out there, there's no question that uh, red meat has simply earned this reputation <coughs> by uh, apparently there's something sufficient about animal protein in red meat that leads to the development of cancer of the large intestine at a much greater rate. And, those <coughs> and that's been replicated on a number of occasions, enough so that everybody in the World Health Organization from around the world was able to put together a consensus that red meat had the same level of carcinogenicity, the threat of getting cancer, as did smoking. End of story. In terms of heart disease, is there a difference between eating beef, chicken, turkey, fish, cheese, milk, or eggs? Yeah. It's a question of whether you want to be shot or hung. <laughs> yeah. You can get heart disease with either one of those. In chapter seven of Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease, what did you mean by, why didn't anyone tell me? Sadly today, with all due respect to my cardiovascular colleagues, when they go through medical school and when they go through their postgraduate cardiology training, they really don't spend much time, if any, about nutrition. As a matter of fact, when I find sometimes that I'm presenting my presentation on reversing heart disease and I talk all about the endothelial cells and nitric oxide, they, they're they a little bit bewildered. That's not something they hear much about at all. They never communicate it to their patients. This is the kind of story that I frequently hear from a patient. First of all, all the patients that I see are self-referred. They're not referred by their doctors. They've gotten curious about their disease. They've gone to the internet. They've looked it up and they find out about disease reversal. And I guess my name is one of those that comes up. They come, they see us, they hear all about this and they really go after it. And they, two or three months later when they're back home, they, uh, they see their doctor. And the doctor says, oh, your blood pressure is coming down. We're gonna have to reduce your blood pressure medication. You've lost some weight, your diabetes is going away. We're gonna to have to reduce your diabetic medication. Oh my goodness, your cholesterol is really starting to fall. We're gonna to have to decrease your cholesterol lowering medication, but that's good. It's being done in the hands of an expert who recognizes that there's less need for these medications. And then uh, <clears throat> the patient is being congratulated by their doctor at home for what they've <clears throat> done. And the patient says to the doctor, why didn't you, why did I have to go to Cleveland to learn this? Why did, uh, and see Dr. Esselstyn, why, why, wouldn't you, why didn't you share this with me? And he said, well, I gave us up. I tried it a few times, but nobody would seem to follow it. Uh, I think we've got some insight into that. If you're going to make a lifestyle change, you've really got to show a patient respect. And by that, I mean, you've got really to show them your time. If you think as a physician that in a 12 or 15 minute office visit that you're gonna get a patient to make a lifestyle change, you've been smoking something. That, doesn't, that ain't gonna happen. But when you do take the time, well, for instance, right now, 
We do this in groups of 12 or 14 patients on a single day. It's a six hour seminar. And in that six hour seminar, people are gonna get information about how they have created their disease and precisely how uh, we're gonna make them empowered as the locus of, of control to halt and reverse their disease, yeah. And at the same time, everybody gets a hefty notebook. And in that notebook is a copy of every PowerPoint slide that I used, several of our scientific articles, a 44-page handout with many additional recipes that add to the 240, which are in the two books that we're gonna give them. They also have a hour and a quarter presentation from a marvelous woman with 30 years experience acquiring and preparing plant-based foods, dealing with reading ingredients, travel in restaurants. And then everybody <clears throat> at the seminar is going to get a hefty notebook that has a copy of every one of my PowerPoint slides as well, I mentioned. Then everybody is going to hear now from two or three local or regional participants who had a, uh, who've had a, previously had a successful experience, who share their story with those in, a, in attendance so those in attendance can say to themselves, listen, if he or she can do this, I can do this. And uh, then we have a wonderful plant-based luncheon and, and stay in touch as necessary with uh, email uh, or phone call. And yet, the, the way it's established now, I never try to drive a wedge between the doctor at home and their patient. Because as I mentioned, we want those doctors to monitor their medication and reduce, reduce it as appropriately, yeah. Why do you say we've built a billion dollar health industry around an illness that does not even exist on half the planet? Yeah, that's uh, something that I think is increasingly an embarrassment to the medical profession. If you go to work as a cardiologist in the Papua Highlands in New Guinea, Central Africa, rural China, Okinawa, you better plan on selling pencils. You're not gonna have any business. They don't have heart disease. Why? They're all thriving on whole food, plant-based nutrition. And uh, it's not a billion. I mean, the, uh, there are two University of Chicago econo economists, Topel and Murphy. And writing in the University of Chicago Press in 1991, they estimate that if we get rid of heart disease in this nation, we will save $40 trillion. That's not talking about hypertension, diabetes, right? strokes. Get rid of cardiovascular disease. 40 trillion. What would that do to our national debt? <laughs> what research or studies convinced you that a whole food plant-based diet is ideal? What, what convinced me? I think... Uh, there's no question when I, was, when I was doing this global research to find out the cultures where breast cancer was less frequent, uh, it became apparent that there were cultures where cardiovascular disease was virtually unheard of. Colin Campbell went over to, uh, 250,000 death certificates in a province in China, not one heart attack. <laughs> I mean, pretty amazing stuff. Now, China, if you look, that's rural China. You go to urban China, you go to the large cities, Kentucky Fried, McDonald's. I mean, we are giving them the gift of hypertension, diabetes, obesity, and higher rates of cancer. Yeah, it's, it's pretty atrocious. 
what, uh, what has happened. But if the, as soon as we can really get the cardiovascular community on board, uh, because they have got to be taught in their training about how to, really, what is the causation of this illness that they have been designated to treat. Can you summarize everything we've talked about here today in 15 seconds? Coronary artery heart disease is nothing more than a toothless paper tiger that need never, ever exist. And if it does exist, it need never, ever progress. This is a completely benign, foodborne illness. What's the one thing I need to do today? Recognize what are the foods that are going to destroy your endothelium every time they pass your lips and get rid of any drop of any oil, right? Anything that's meat, fish, chicken, fowl, turkey, and eggs, and anything that's dairy, milk, cream, butter, cheese, ice cream, and yogurt, and sugary foods, sugary cakes, buy it. Cakes, pies, cookies, stevia, agave, excesses of maple syrup, molasses, and honey. And any overdosing of nuts, peanut butter, cashew sauce, so forth. What is it about the real truth about health conference that makes you want to come here and speak? Well, the reason I come to this conference, I appreciate the, the depth and uh, of, of energy and of uh, vision that this conference seems to have for trying to communicate with the public uh, the message about health, whole food, plant-based nutrition, and, and how they can best articulate this message for the public. Uh, to me, that's powerful, rewarding. I don't come every year because I don't want people to get tired of me. <laughs> but, uh, but often we can get some new wrinkles to our message uh, every other year and, and hopefully uh, be a part of the team that's helping people. For people that want to learn more about your work, where should they go? My website, dressleston.com.